morning. I got two Bibles up here and I gotta figure out which one I want to use. Hmm. Let's start with this one. One is a King James Version, one is a New King James Version, and the New King James Version is a lot easier to read. As Ray said, that is a funny, strange choice of words that the end of all flesh is before me. Last week, we looked at the condition of the world in Noah's day. We saw the comparison from that time to our time, for Jesus said that, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Mm -hmm. That the conditions that were in Noah's day will repeat themselves in our day. So let me ask you a question. Has human nature gotten better over the years? No. Have we evolved at all to a better type of person? No. Or are we still the same from when God destroyed the world the first time? Same. Culture changes, technology changes, but human nature outside of the indwelling of Jesus Christ does not change. Amen. The earth was filled with violence then, and the earth is filled with violence now. Is that right? Amen. Now, I was listening to a sermon yesterday from Andy Stanley. That's the son of Charles Stanley. You guys may know him. He's a well-known preacher. I love listening to him. Uh, but Andy made this comment that in Noah's day, there was no law from God because the law wouldn't come until hundreds of years after that when it was given to Moses. I like that book reading. So my question for you would be, think about that statement. There was no law. That the only law Adam and Eve had was don't eat from this tree. That was it. The question is, is that true? Because they ate from that tree, and then they became sinners. But Paul tells me that without the law, there can be no sin. I wouldn't have known sin if it wasn't for what? The law. What law? It would be the law of ten commandments, correct? The law that says, you shall have no other God before me. The law that says, thou shalt not kill. Do not make any graven images and do not bow down to those images. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That law. So here is this text that Ray read that says, the end of all flesh has come before me. Because the earth is filled with violence. If there was no law that they were under, how could God condemn them to death? How could He destroy the world and still be a righteous God? He couldn't be. He couldn't. So there had to be a law that they broke, correct? Yes. Here's a question for you. The Bible tells us in the beginning of Genesis when God created man that we were created in His image. Is that correct? Yes. And because we are created in His image, that means we have certain responsibilities to our Creator. Mm -hmm. And that we are required to live and act and move and breathe in a way that glorifies Him. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And when that doesn't happen, then God has the right to step in and make whatever changes that He deems necessary. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Because you're going to have to answer this question sometime or another. And that is, how could a loving God destroy an entire world? Now, we saw today in this video this morning that there's how many people living on this earth? Seven, seven billion, with a B, souls that live on this planet. And that Jesus is going to come back, and we are a church that teaches that he's going to come back soon, and that if history has shown anything, it's that most people don't follow God. In the days of Noah, how many people were saved? Eight. How could God, in His compassion and mercy, destroy an entire world? Eight. Eight. 
Okay, hold up for a minute. Ricky said what? They had kicked him out. They had, they had turned their backs on him. On God. Right. And you said it's because of God's mercy and compassion. Is that an oxymoron? No. And that's right. Think about this. God never intended the human race to be sinners. Did He create you from Adam to be sinners? No, He created you to follow Him to be perfect and to be a part of His entire universe. That was a universe full of harmony and perfection until you had the great deceiver, which was Lucifer, who became Satan. Now, I want you to understand just how dangerous Satan is. In the end, who carries the full blame for all those people in Noah's time to be lost? And in the end, when Jesus comes a second time, who will bear the full burden of every soul that has been lost. Why? Because he is the originator of sin and he's the original murderer. Okay? Satan has caused sin and deception. Now, that doesn't take any responsibility away from you for the decisions that you make. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. But in the end, Satan will bear the punishment for his sin and for all of this mess. That came from that sin. So was God just in destroying the antediluvians? And is God going to be just when he comes back the second time and destroys this world with fire? And the answer is yes. Why and how can you come up with that conclusion of yes, that God will destroy a world and it will be the right thing to do? Oh, you guys got quiet. <coughs> say it, you're right. Sin is out of control. Okay, what were you going to say? <coughs> God's plan has always been to have a world, an earth, that was populated by people who were loyal and who followed him without fail. Another word for that would be perfect. God created a perfect world, and He expected a human race to be perfect with it. And when that didn't happen, that didn't thwart God's plans. But God, in His mercy and in His wisdom, allowed sin to play out. And allowed each one of you here today to make your decision whether you will follow Him, whether you will reject the teachings of Satan, and accept the teachings of God. That God is merciful, that God is just, that God is love. But God requires something from you. Do you agree with that? Does God require something from you? Did God lower his standards when Adam and Eve sinned? Did God change anything about what he required from mankind when Adam and Eve sinned? What God required was after their sin, a perfect sacrifice to pay for that sin. And brothers and sisters, that sacrifice was, giving, was given in the form of His Son, Jesus Christ. And you have a choice today, as everybody else after the fall of Adam and Eve has had the same choice. You will either accept that sacrifice, that perfect sacrifice, or you will be that sacrifice. And you can't be that sacrifice and so, hence, why you have eternal damnation. Do you guys understand that, right? The, the problem wasn't believing a lie. The problem was not believing the, the truth. The truth. I like that. Well said. So, turn with me to Genesis. Chapter 6. Let's look at verses 13 and 14. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. Why has the end of all flesh come before God? He answers it. It's because the earth is filled with what? Right. Violence through them. You notice God didn't take responsibility for that. He said that the earth is filled with violence through who? Yeah. Them, the people. 
the ones that turned their back on God. This was never God's plan for it to turn out this way. God created perfection, and God only creates perfection. But this is why the Bible calls sin the mystery of iniquity, because if I could explain it to you, that would justify it. And there is no justification for sin. Amen. It is foreign and alien to God. God never intended it. Amen? Amen. And the great thing is, is that because He never intended it, He's going to create the world all over again. Mm -hmm. And those that are there, those that are faithful, those that will be redeemed will populate this world and they will be perfect. And they will follow God all the days of eternity without ever sinning ever again. Mm -hmm. Because there will be no devil, no devil, no tempter, no disunity or disharmony. There will be love. The ultimate government of God, a government based on love. And so in verse 13, God looks down and He sees the condition of the world that is filled with violence, that because of man, God has to step in. So God finds a man named Noah. And God says to Noah in verse 14, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. Its width 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits. What's a cubit? 18 inches. How big is this boat? Okay, let me find my paper here. So, God gives him dimensions. The length of the yard shall be 300 cubits. That's about 450 feet long. Okay? 450 feet long. That's a pretty good sized boat, right? <laughs> I don't know. It's okay. Donald, what's the length of this building? It's not 450 feet. No. That was trying to get a comparison. Yeah. Okay, listen. So 450 feet long. How many? How, how wide is it? How many cubits? 50? So that's 75 foot wide. And it's going to be 45 foot high. Now, they said that that's almost the size of an aircraft carrier. Put a ball in my hand. Okay? So, it's a big boat. Right? It's a big boat. Now, the question is, is God tells him to make this in your backyard. No, he didn't live by water because he made it in his backyard. Now, did Noah and his sons, were they the only ones that worked on this boat? No. It's a pretty big, that's a pretty big undertaking for four people, and Noah was 600 years old. But listen, this is something I want you to think about. Noah was 600 years old, and then God tells him, build me a boat. And Noah didn't say, you know how old I am? And he says to him, I want you to take the animals and bring them into the boat. He didn't say, dude, I am too old for this. At 600 years old, Noah still had the vitality, the strength to be able to do this without a problem. Not only do this, but to see the world destroyed, land that boat on empty ground, and watch it come back again. And he had the strength of character not to go out of his mind. Can you imagine being one of only eight people on the face of the earth? Now listen, if you got upset with your children, and you got upset with your wife and their wives all in the same day, you had nobody else to talk to. <laughs> we see the effects of floods, of fires, earthquakes, natural disasters, and they can be devastating. Tsunamis that wipe out 
entire coastlines, but can you imagine coming off of that ark and looking at what used to be a pristine, beautiful, perfect world that God created and seeing it then? And you wonder why he planted the vineyard and started to drink? Now that wasn't a joke, I'm serious. There was a reason why Noah did what Noah did. But 600 years old, you get to understand the kind of strength this man had and the strength of character. Would you be able to handle that? If our electricity is turned off for a week, we go nuts. I had a woman that lived in the apartments. You know, she lived in a uh, duplex behind the apartments that the hospital owns when the hurricanes came in. And after three days without power, she went after her daughter and the cops had to come and put her in uh, the hospital. <laughs> Paddy, because she had no electricity and no running water for three days and she lost her mind. Okay? She lost her mind. Now, what happens in New York City when the lights go out? Right? Now, can you imagine what it was like for Noah to get off of that boat and be one of eight people left? And yet he did it. So, everything that he remembered, the culture, the technology, everything was what? Gone, right? The only thing that they had was what they took on that boat. Everything else was gone. So I want to read you a couple things from The Spirit of Prophecy. That's why I got the big book. About Noah's day. I said last week, was Noah the only one that preached the end of the world? No. Who came before Noah? Methuselah. And who was with Methuselah? Enoch. Was Enoch a preacher for God? Yes. Yes, he was. The Bible makes that clear in the book of Jude. And let me ask you a question. If Lester was here preaching to you today about the end of the world, the second coming, and tomorrow he was gone and couldn't find him, and he didn't die, because you couldn't find him, he just wasn't here no more. He went with God. Do you think that would be a powerful statement? about the truth of what he was preaching? Absolutely. Okay. Where did Enoch go? He was translated, correct? Now you better believe that his neighbors were going, where is he at? Did you find a body? Nothing. God translated him. And now you have Methuselah preaching. And now you have this man Noah not only preaching, but building a boat. Now you better believe that there were people who were listening to him. Okay. Not only listening, but those who helped him build the ark. Don't you think that would be a great testimony of what's going on? Yes. Yeah, and what's going to happen? Especially that it's not at a dry dock. It's just That's it's right. Dry dry. So, so Noah, where's this water coming from? Uh, okay. Okay. So, about Enoch. Did Enoch see God face to face, or did he see God only by faith? Uh, it says here that Enoch, did he see God by his side? Only by faith. He knew that the Lord was there, and he adhered steadfastly to the principles of truth. We too are to walk with God. When we do this, our faces will be lighted up by the brightness of his presence, and when we meet one another, we shall speak of his power, saying, praise God, Good is the Lord, and good is the word of the Lord. Now, Enoch walked with God, while of the world around him sacred history records, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Enoch's righteous life was in marked contrast with the wicked people around him. His piety, his purity, his unswerving integrity were the results 
of his walking with God. While the wickedness of the world was the result of their walking with the deceiver of mankind. There never has been and never will be an age when the moral darkness will be so dense as when Enoch lived a life of irreproachable righteousness. If you get anything from that, get this, that there is no reason and no culture and no sinfulness that should drag you down to that level. Mm. If Enoch could walk with God, he didn't do it because of his own righteousness. He did it because Christ dwelt with him. We can do the same thing. All right, so one last thing. There perished in the flood greater inventions of art and human skill than the world knows today. The arts destroyed were more than the boasted arts of today. That's letter 65 printed in 1898. How did man gain his knowledge of how to devise from the Lord by studying the formation and habits of different animals. Every animal is a lesson book, and from the use they make of their bodies and the weapons provided them, men have learned to make apparatus for every kind of work. If men could only know how many arts have been lost to our world, they would not talk so fluently of the dark ages. Could they have seen how God once worked through his human subjects, they would speak with less confidence of the arts of the antediluvian world. More was lost in the flood in many ways than men today know. Looking upon the world, God saw that the intellect he had given man was perverted, that the imagination of his heart was evil, and that continually. God had given these men knowledge. He had given them valuable ideas that they might carry out his plan, but the Lord saw that those whom he designed should possess wisdom, tact, and judgment were using every quality of the mind to glorify themselves. By the waters of the flood, he blotted this long lived race from the earth, and with them perished the knowledge that they had used only for evil. When the earth was repeopled, the Lord trusted his wisdom more sparingly to men, giving them only the ability that they would need in carrying out his great. I love that statement. Yeah. All right, so we come to this point in Earth's history where God looks down and he says, this can't continue. He's going to end it. Now, brothers and sisters, this ties in right with our day today. For did not Daniel in his prophecy predict that at a certain period in time, that the cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven would take place? Yes. And that the next great events after that would be the second coming of Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. And that with the second coming of Jesus Christ, God would finally make an end to sin? You grasp what I just said, right? Yeah. The end of sin comes when? Christ. When the devil and the sinners are destroyed in the lake of fire. Because where there's one sinner, there is you guys understand that? This is why it's called a purifying fire. This is why Peter counsels you not to hold too dear to the things of this earth because everything you see is going to melt with fervent heat. Right? So as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when Jesus comes back. If you look at our day and you look at Noah's day, there's not much difference. The earth is filled with violence. More people serve themselves than they serve God. His image is being marred year by year. And if something isn't done, the righteous will be blotted out and only the wicked will remain. And so God will look down and say, once again, the end of all flesh is before me. The question, brothers and sisters, is what part will you play in this last great event of Earth's history? Will you follow God, the Father, or will you follow the Father of laws? Ray read a text from the Spirit of Prophecy that stated that there were many who believed the preaching of Noah. 
who believed the preaching of Methuselah, but they backslid because Noah preached for 120 years. That's more than anybody who is in this room will live. And they lived so long that they thought nothing has changed. We go from day to day, season to season, year to year, and nothing has changed. And you're telling me the end of all things is going to come? And so they go back into their lives. They get busy with work. They get busy amusing themselves. They get busy just looking at themselves. And they lost their chance to be saved. As it was in the days of Noah, it's going to be when Jesus comes back. Do we not do the same today? How many people have you seen come through the doors of this church who are not here today? For whatever reason, in the end, it's a choice they made. If I've hurt your feelings, I apologize. But I'm not your salvation. Amen. And if you don't like me, and you don't come to God because you don't like me, that's your problem. Do you understand that? That's a choice you make. This is why pastors are only supposed to stay at a church so long. Okay? <laughs> I'm hoping you're not trying to tell me something. <laughs> as long as you don't tell me that, we're good. So listen. In this life, you know that you can be hot one day and you can be cold the next day. You can be hot one moment and cold the next. Didn't Elijah himself stand up and slay 400 prophets of Baal? Yeah. And then the next day he's hiding from one woman? Yeah. <laughs> he was human, right? <laughs> the only way you continue to serve God is by having a relationship with God. Amen. Through His Son, Jesus Christ. And you have to walk with Him day by day. Hour by hour. Because <clears throat> let me ask you a question. Have you ever left church here inspired by whoever you heard and then go out and get mad at somebody in your family because they said something to you? Or you left the church because something unresolved at your house took place and when you got back there it was unresolved and you weren't even thinking about church. You got to the house and you started yelling at your spouse or your kids or your dog. That's us, right? This is why you have to have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Amen. Because I can love you now, and the next moment I may not like you so much. Amen. Or vice versa, you know what I'm saying? But Jesus says that we are to love not just those that love us, but who? Even our enemies. Yes. 